to do so quietly, please. Thank you. And the next item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 16380 in the name of Ian Gray on the 25th anniversary commemoration of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Ian Gray to open the debate for around seven minutes, please, Mr Gray. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, as we meet, uh, Rwanda is observing 100 days of national mourning, which began on the 7th of April. That was the 25th anniversary of the day in 1994 when the genocide against the Tutsis began in Rwanda. <clears throat> in the following 100 days, around 1 million people were slaughtered, around 70% of the Tutsi population. Appalling atrocities were committed by the armed forces, by the Hutu and Tarahamwe militias, but also by civilians against other civilians, colleagues against colleagues, and neighbours against neighbours. And most of this barely believable intensity of murder was perpetrated with nothing more than machetes. Presiding officer, the world knew this was happening. At the time I worked for Oxfam, I remember being told of the now famous letter sent by a group of Adventist church pastors who had taken refuge with thousands of their congregations in their church, a letter to the president of the Adventist church. It began, we wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families. It pleaded for his help. But the church president, Pastor Takurutimana, was a Hutu. And so the next day, they were killed with their families, and he was later convicted of helping to organize the massacre. With Oxfam, I campaigned and lobbied to get the international community to intervene, but they refused. The UN had a peacekeeping force in place in Rwanda. Their commander, General Dallaire, had told his superiors in the infamous genocide facts that May that genocide against the Tutsis was being planned. He was told only to protect foreign nationals, not to intervene in the murder of the Tutsi people, and the UN force was then largely withdrawn. It is said that they burned their blue berets in shame as they left. When the killing ended, fearing retribution, the Hutu population of Rwanda fled the country, a million people a day crossing the border at one point. In late August of that year, I spent some time with Oxfam's emergency team in eastern Zaire, and then a few days in Rwanda itself. In truth, presiding officer, I, I cannot find the words to explain what it is like to see a country empty of its people, one part dead and the rest having fled. But I can say this, what remained was something of the evil done there only days before, a darkness that gripped you at every turn. Rwanda emerged from the genocide devastated, Life expectancy had fallen to 29 years. There were 95,000 orphans. But in the ensuing years, great progress has been made. And although 38% of that country's people still live in poverty, life expectancy is now 67, and economic growth averages 7.5%, one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. Scottish charities such as Comfort Rwanda and Tear Fund Scotland have played a part in that. Uh, and my own constituency, East Lothian, has a special place in its heart for Rwanda too, because during the 2014 Commonwealth Games, the Rwandan team was hosted by East Lothian. And those links have continued through sport and local schools. For example, Trinent Colts Football Club, who have sent delegations to Rwanda to do coaching and community building work in that country. 
Presiding officer, I, I think that we can hardly imagine how difficult it is to heal the wounds of such a thing as this. It is true that some of the leaders of the genocide have been tried, convicted, and imprisoned, but the guilt was widespread. And the Tutsi people of Rwanda still have to undertake acts of forgiveness and reconciliation that we can hardly understand every single day in life. All we can do is try to learn the lessons. And what are they? Firstly, not all military interventions are bad. To this day, I burn with shame that my country failed to act to save those lives. Because I know that they could have. And I know that I failed to win the argument that they should. Secondly, we must always remember genocide and the Holocaust. But we should be careful when we say never again. We let this happen in Rwanda. We let it happen a year later in Srebrenica, in Bosnia. So instead of patting ourselves in the back at our empathy for the genocides of the past, we should ask ourselves, on which genocides today are we turning those backs? And finally, genocide ends with machetes and murder. But that's not how it begins. It begins with the words of hate. The othering of the Tutsi people by Hutu extremists had gone on for a long time before 1994. A radio station, Radio, radio Milkaline, was specifically created to foster hatred of the Tutsi people, who it referred to as cockroaches, and was used ultimately to unleash and encourage the slaughter. This is the lesson that we must learn. We cannot, we must not, we will not tolerate the language of hatred, of othering, of dehumanization anywhere, ever. And perhaps then we will earn the right to say never again. So our message then to the people of Rwanda should be this. We let you down in 1994. But you have our solidarity, our prayers, and our love now in your 100 days of mourning. And we will try to do better in future. Move on to the open debate. And can I have speeches around four minutes, please? Kenneth Gibson, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. 25 years on from the slaughter that ripped Rwanda apart, it is right we commemorate that genocide and reflect on its legacy for the Rwandan people and the international peacekeeping community. And I congratulate Ian Gray for securing today's debate and providing us all with the opportunity to do so. On 7th of April 1994, the majority Hutu of Rwanda turned on the Tutsi minority in a wave of calculated violence. The spotlight at the fuse of the already tense relationship between Hutus and Tutsis was the death of Rwandan President Juvenal Habyarimana, a Hutu, when his plane was shot down above Kigali Airport the previous day. A hundred days later, when the killing finally stopped, the death toll stood up to one million, comprised of both Tutsis and moderate Hutus who had bra bravely opposed the bloodshed. While we still don't know who was definitively responsible for the attack, what is undeniable is that within hours, a campaign of violence spread from the capital across Rwanda. Elite government forces supported by the inter a Hutu militia, rounded up and executed Tutsi military and political leaders. Roadblocks were hastily erected to catch Rwandans with personal documentation, identifying them as Tutsis, a distinction introduced in the 1930s by the Belgian colonial authorities to divide and rule. In rural areas where Hutus and Tutsis are sometimes married and had children, government, uh, government propaganda and radio broadcasts and newspaper articles urged Hutus to pick up any weapon they could find, machetes, clubs, to kill or maim their neighbours. They were given incentives such as money or food or told they could claim the land of the Tutsis they murdered. 
Some even stooped to destroy churches where Tutsis had taken refuge. Sexual violence was also endemic with the rape of up to half a million women, accelerating the spread of AIDS and the stigmatization of the offspring of these assaults as children of the killers. The scale of the slaughter was shocking, Africa's largest genocide in modern times. The horror did not end even after the Rwandan Patriotic Front captured Kigali as the torrent of killings washed into the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo, where Hutu militias continued to operate, igniting years of strife in Africa's Great Lakes region. Shamefully, the Rwandan genocide was largely ignored by the international community, despite the United Nations having 2,500 troops in Rwanda. Years later, Kofi Annan, head of peacekeeping operations and later UN Secretary General said, all of us must bitterly regret that we did not do more to prevent it. It's heartbreaking that the world's largest peacekeeping force failed to intervene just as it failed a year later in Srebrenica. President Emmanuel Macron of France last month ordered a two-year inquiry into his country's role into the Rwandan genocide, given its significant role in French-speaking Africa. Perhaps this signifies that the international community is ready to take responsibility for failing to protect Rwandans. That is vital to ensure lessons are learned to prevent future atrocities. Hearteningly, over the last 25 years, Rwanda has rebuilt its institutions and economy. To bring perpetrators of the genocide to justice, the UN conducted more than 70 tribunals and Rwanda's courts tried up to 20,000 individuals. Tutsis and Hutus, survivors and killers, now struggle to live side by side. I, I, I'm, ple I, I'm, I'm pleased that Ian Gray's motion refers to Scotland's uh, close relationship with Rwanda and our two countries' efforts to move forward together. Despite Rwanda's recovery, deprivation remains high and persistent, with 38% of people living in poverty and 16% in extreme poverty. Rwanda is now in the Commonwealth of one of Scotland's African partner countries, and the Scottish Government is funding the Sustainable Economic and Agricultural Development Programme to improve the lives of 30,000 people across 207 Rwandan villages. This programme aims to create alternative income generation and access savings and loans through self-help groups. Agriculture is Rwanda's economic mainstay, with 70% of the population engaged in the sector, although farming methods are badly out of date and farmers are vulnerable to land degradation, soil erosion and climate shocks. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government supports the use of environmentally friendly agricultural techniques to improve crop productivity and food security in Rwanda, training how to build energy saving stoves and sources of renewable energy, particularly important in Rwanda, which is one of Africa's most densely populated countries and very scarce land. While we reflect in the legacy of the brutal massacre of 20 years ago, Rwanda now looks forward. Whether examining ways at preventing similar atrocities or working with international partners to support sustainable development and lift people out of poverty, there is a role for Scotland in Rwanda's future. <coughs> Jeremy Balfour, followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer, and can I uh, congratulate Ian Gray not only on his motion, uh, but his uh, opening speech uh, this afternoon, which I think sets uh, the tone um, and the historical perspective of what has happened. Uh, as I said previously, Mr Chamber, last September, uh, through Tear Fund, I had the privilege of visiting Rwanda and seeing some of the projects that are going on at the moment. I think Ian Gray was absolutely correct. I was a young uh, solicitor here in Edinburgh uh, 25 years ago. Some of us were at school, university, working, and it went on on our televisions, and we simply ignored it. A million people within 100 days, and we in the West, United Nations, stood back and let it happen. And I think one of the things we can reflect on as a parliament and as politicians is, as Ian Gray has pointed out, when will this happen again? And if it happens again, what will we do? It's not enough for us to simply have debates and warm words. We do need to intervene appropriately. But I want to concentrate my remarks on what has happened since. Because I think one of the things that struck me visiting Rwanda nearly 25 years on from a genocide was the reconciliation that has taken place within that country. Uh, I was bored over by the way that people have been able to live again in neighborhoods, in villages, from the president to politicians, to the media, to the church, 
to individuals, there has been an immense reconciliation. I will never forget uh, a Monday uh, in a village under the beating sun, talking to a man. And it emerged that that man had murdered 30 or 40 people during the genocide. He went to prison. He had actually become a Christian. He had come to reconcile himself. The only place he could go was back to his village. But he knew that most of the village would turn on him. But on that village, he pointed to a lady and he said, I killed that lady's husband and children. But when I came back to the village, she was the first one to come over and welcome me. That, I think, is reconciliation beyond my understanding and I think puts into perspective a lot of what we talk about here in this parliament. And I, too, welcome the intervention of the Scottish Government working in uh, partnership with organisations such as Tear Fund. Um, as we've heard, the statistic, there's a long way to go, uh, but there is good progress. Things like water, things that we take for granted, the Scottish Government previously have funded. Um, I think the self-help groups, which allow individuals within small communities to pool resources, to pool money, to be able to bring things back together, um, is an amazing thing. Again, one of the projects I remember visiting last year was uh, a number of women who have pooled resources to start uh, a sewing machines to make things, which they're now selling not only to, to the local village, the local community, but beyond. But I think Ian Gray is absolutely right. This part of this debate must be us uh, as a country, um, as, a, as a, a European community, as the West, is to say sorry to the people of Rwanda for turning our backs when they needed us the most. We need to learn from that. We need to move on from that. And I welcome this debate this afternoon. Claire Baker, followed by John Finney. Uh, President Officer, I thank Ian Gray for securing this debate and providing us with an opportunity to commemorate all those who suffered and died during the atrocities which took place in Rwanda 25 years ago. I also welcome the insight that Ian has provided from his time in Rwanda and Zaire with Oxfam, seeing firsthand the aftermath of the horrific events. Marking the loss of approximately 1 million lives in 100 days 25 years ago, Rwanda is currently observing 100 days of mourning. Here in the Scottish Parliament, we should also reflect on the terrible events of 1994, remembering the lives lost and the damage that was done. Around 70% of the Tutsi population was slaughtered in those 100 days with appalling atrocities committed by militia, by armed forces, and as we have heard, by civilians. A briefing from Amnesty International highlights concerns related to the current situation in Rwanda with the sad reality of a country which still faces political and human rights challenges, very much evident in the reports they have provided of severe restrictions on freedom of expression and reported persecution of political opponents. But we should also recognise the significant progress that has been made from what was a very divisive and bloody situation to where Rwanda is today. Following the genocide, Rwanda was socially and economically devastated with GDP growth at minus 50%, life expectancy only 29 years, and with 95,000 orphaned children. There is no denying that challenges remain, particularly with high levels of poverty, food insecurity, and malnutrition. But 25 years on, significant progress has been made, with economic growth in the 10 years to 2017 at 7.5%, and life expectancy now at 67 years. It is also a country with 43% of the population under the age of 15, which presents a country with many challenges, but also with huge potential. I hope that Scotland continues to be a key partner to Rwanda and to provide support during its ongoing process of recovery. I welcome the work of organisations like Tear Fund in delivering Scottish funded programmes, which have worked to heal communities and to provide access to loans and new skills to reduce poverty. I now would like to speak a little about Chantelle Marimi. Born in the then called Zaire to Tutsi parents who had fled there from Rwanda as refugees, Chantelle spent her childhood in segregation and extreme poverty. 
She was 18 years old when the 1994 genocide took place and her family spent months in hiding, particularly when the killing spilled over to Zaire's refugee camps. When Chantal and her family returned to Rwanda, the aftermath of the genocide was all around, with death an everyday occurrence. The psychological impact of the genocide affected the entire population. In time, Chantal was able to secure a job working with the UN and later an opportunity to come to Fife on a temporary visa, emigrating to Scotland in 1999. Moving to Scotland allowed Chantal to address the trauma she had experienced and to write a book about her story, the proceeds of which go to her education foundation in Rwanda. She is now employed by Fife Council and an active community member who have I had, have had the privilege of hearing speak about her experiences. Chantal also set up a project which lets Scots visit Rwanda, build links with its people and hear their stories. The project works to raise awareness of Rwanda's history and to promote positive relationships between Scots and refugees. In recognition of her significant achievements, Chantal won Woman of the Year 2018 at the Scottish Women's Awards. While Chantal's story is an individual example of links between Scotland and Rwanda, it does serve as a powerful reminder of the capacity for individuals, communities and societies to recover and build bright futures and how positivity and connectivity can be born of even the worst atrocities. This has been a powerful debate and I very much thank Ian Gray for securing it. John Siddy, followed by James Dornan. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. And I too would like to, to thank Ian Gray for um, bringing this important subject and difficult subject to the Chamber and for his very powerful speech and the, the insight and experience that he shared with us, likewise, Mr. Balfour. Um, it was a Jewish lawyer and Polish refugee, uh, um, Raphael Lemkin, who coined the word genocide in 1943. And that's a combination of the Greek and Latin. And I think given the Jewish, Polish, Greek, Latin, it, the fusion of these two languages shows how interrelated as a species we humans are. And indeed it was Mr. Lemkin's growing awareness of the Armenian genocide he talked about my worries about the murder of the innocent became more powerful, more meaningful to me. I didn't know all the answers, but I felt that a law against this type of racial or religious murder must be adopted by the world. world. And of course, it was adopted. It was adopted in, in 1948, uh, uh, the international definition of genocide within the 1948 convention, and sh essentially enshrining the message, uh, which we've heard in this debate already, and no doubt we'll hear again, the phrase, never again in international law. Now, 1994 should have been a great year for the African continent, uh, for those who value democracy, humanity, the right to self-determination and a new future. In May of that year, after three centuries of white rule, Nelson Mandela became the, <coughs> excuse me, the South African's first black president. And at his inauguration, he said, never, never again will this beautiful land experience the oppression of one by another. Sadly, it was around that time, of course, that Rwanda saw the worst of humanity at play. And the, the name is, and I, I fear forever will be associated with the terrible genocide. Um, and I think that, uh, one of the many positive uh, um, and powerful things that Mr. Gray said was, it begins with the words of hate. So I have in my notes here, I have Hutu people, Tutsi people, but actually it's people. That's what we should call them. And it's these, of course, we should celebrate differences, but we are, we are all very much one and the same, and a million deaths and a hundred days of bloodshed between April and July. And as I, I think uh, Mr. Valfour said, we knew, and of course we know that wholesale slaughter wasn't new to the world, whether that's from the pogroms visited in Jewish communities, the Holocaust, the Holodomor in, in Ukraine, like the Irish famine, killing by starvation, Armenia, Cambodia, Bosnia, the treatment of indigenous peoples by colonialists, including Scots. Um, um, a shameful history mankind has in many respects. Um, I, I was drawn to a, an article in uh, The Independent written by Rachel Burns um, December last year, why the UN Convention on Genocide is still failing 70 years on. And, and it picks up in some comments that have already been made, and, and I quoted here, first, the very application of the term genocide is applied too slowly and cautiously when atrocities happen. Um, and I fear that is because it's who, that is me rather than her, who rather than what. Um, and there's no excuse given how small the world is. Second, she talks about the international community fails to act effectively against it. And thirdly, she talks about too few pen, uh, perpetrators um, are actually convicted. It's heartening to see when there are convictions. And it is, of course, about the role of the, the, the international community. And 
a, a thing I've kept returning to in, in this chamber when speaking, particularly on uh, matters perhaps connected with Palestine and elsewhere, the, the, the UN's role and the lack of respect there is for the UN. It's not a group of equals, there's a veto for the big boys, and might is not right in this. And the developing world must have respect for the international law. So the 100 days of national mourning have begun, and uh, uh, one of the things that we'll have to deal with is the, the legacy of the psychological impact for the, the communities of this. Uh, I believe the, the human spirit is strong. Um, I think uh, we must be positive. We must believe that uh, uh, things uh, c can get better. And, but I would pose the question, what role is there for each of us to play as parliamentary, parliamentarians, as global citizens that shape the future of humanity? 1994 was the same year that the US opened Guantanamo, for instance, that the Provisional IRA declared a ceasefire, some significant events. And the future of our fragile planet and the lovely country and people of Rwanda, our sisters and brothers, must be at the forefront of our thoughts. We will not forget, uh, but we must learn and look to the future. Thank you. James Dornan, followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I too would like to thank Ian Gray for securing today's very important debate and also thank him for his clearly personal and passionate speech which laid out the reality of the impact of, of the events of, of that 100 days. In 2003, the United Nations General Assembly officially proclaimed April the 7th the International Day of Reflection and the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. And as I say, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak about these atrocities 25 years on. We must never forget just how awful the events of that day, those days were, the impact on the people of Rwanda. But we should also remember the the horrors of what happened in Rwanda and the knock-on effect it had to other areas in that region. After Rwanda's genocidal Hutu regime was overthrown, more than two million Hutus are believed to have fled into what was then Zaire, a DR Congo, fearing reprisals against them by the new Tutsi-dominated government. Among them were many of the militia men responsible for the genocide. They quickly allied themselves with the government and began to attack DR Congo's sizable population of ethnic Tutsis who had lived in the country for generations. It's widely believed in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo that the Rwanda genocide was the start of the region's more recent problems. In an article written five years ago by the journalist Maud Julian for the 20th anniversary commemorations, the massacres of Hutus in neighboring Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, or Zaire as it was, was known then, have largely been forgotten. Within her article, a, who's a, she's a human rights activist in Goma, said, people don't talk about it enough, but the Rwandan genocide was like flicking over the first domino. And I had never been to Rwanda, but I have been to countries such as South Sudan, North Uganda, Malawi, etc. And, I, I, and I've seen the ripple effect from the genocide in Rwanda has been felt right through the regions, and I've seen I've also been to Sarajevo, Belgrade and Srebrenica and as Ian Gray and others have said it was only a year after uh, the events in Rwanda that we had the awful events in Srebrenica and we've seen that flicking over of the first domino approximately at the same time and it doesn't seem to matter what part of the world we're in, the same thing can happen. Ian Gray talked about language and, and John Finney talked about the, the language of hate and that's probably the most important lesson that we can take from this. If you start to other people, if you start to train people to, uh, to behave in a certain way because the people that they, they are targeting are seen to be less than human, then this is the outcome. I think it's vitally important that if we take any lesson from this, we take the lesson that we have to be more respectful when we speak to people. We should not be talking about people as if they're a different species from us. We should be talking about uh, one of the great things that's, that, that Rwanda has done is they've banned the naming of people as Tutsis and Hutu, and they're, they're called Rwandans. They've been taught in school that the they're Rwandans have not to be labelled as Tutsis and Hutu, and I think that's vitally important. We've seen it all through history. We, we saw it in the, the partition in, uh, of India and Pakistan. We saw it in the Balkans. We saw it in Rwanda. And I think it's really important that we take that lesson away from here today and treat people with the respect they deserve. 
The, to be fair to Rwanda, and the, the, what they've done since then has been quite remarkable. To, to go through, as, as Jeremy Balfour was talking about, to go through the reconciliation that they've done after the events that they've had to go through is quite something and is a perfect example of humanity at its best. So hopefully out of these horrible, horrible events, something good will come and, and, and Rwanda will be able to get itself in a place where everybody can forgive uh, if not forget what happened in those terrible days and we can maybe learn the lessons from the horrible things that happened then as well. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased to be able to take part in today's debate and I do congratulate Ian Gray for bringing this to the Chamber this afternoon. Rwanda, as we've heard, is a small country in the African continent surrounded by the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Tanzania and Burundi. And 25 years on, uh, we must remember the genocide that took place. And I pay tribute to the tone of this debate today from all speakers. But I think uh, Ian Gray himself set that tone and I acknowledge that, uh, that it was a very personal and a very passionate speech uh, mm -hmm. and one that uh, I'm sure we all learned from. There is no doubt that uh, the Hutu and the Tutsis uh, found themselves in a, a difficult and a dangerous and a disgraceful situation uh, in the 1990s uh, because that country had had uh, a reasonably good support mechanism in the past uh, where people had lived together and had supported one another, even although there were differences uh, among these individuals and among these tribes that took part. Uh, and it goes back to uh, the United Nations even in the 1960s when uh, it was ruled by Belgium. Uh, and during that time, uh, the colonials thought more primarily of uh, the minority uh, 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 than they did of the majority and that may have started the whole process and thinking of where we ended up uh, when we got to 1994 after that uh, presidential uh, plane crash uh, uh, in Kigali uh, and at, you know at that date that time although there, there was there was nobody uh, there was no culprits at that time uh, when that was started. Uh, it then set the tone that then took place because within hours of that, uh, as we've heard, uh, the presidential guard and members of the Rwandan forces and Hutu militants set up roadblocks and barricades and began slaughtering uh, uh, individuals uh, uh, from across the country. Uh, and although it started off in the capital, it spread. And as we've already heard today, uh, a million people in 100 days were slaughtered. Now, that, that is inconsequential uh, uh, in some respects, but it makes a huge impact on us all, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that that number of people in that number of days could take place and could happen, even in 1994, which is not that far uh, from our memories at all. Uh, so since those dark days, it is right that we remember the aftermath and the extreme national that took part in Rwanda, because once again, it built on uh, the difficulties that they faced. The scars run deep, uh, but uh, great links have now developed between Rwanda and Scotland, and we've heard of some of that today. Uh, and uh, I acknowledge the fact that uh, many organisations and many partner organisations have been playing their part. And we have to also think about what we've been doing in other parts when we look at Malawi and other organisations and other structures that have taken place across different continents. Uh, you know, for myself, uh, the, these 25 years ago, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we can still focus on. So it is vitally important that, that, that Scotland uh, now plays its part in ensuring that we're rebuilding and we're doing all we can to, to refocus and rebuild on what's happening across mm -hmm. Rwanda. Uh, Scotland already has grassroots connections throughout the Rwandan uh, Alliance, the Honorary Consul General, and all the things that are taking place. Uh, and, I, and I pay tribute, as I said earlier, to the charities. We've heard about Tier Fund today uh, that put in a huge amount of effort uh, to ensure that basics uh, are given to the individuals who live uh, uh, and work in that environment. We must have continued to forge links with the country uh, and ensure that uh, in the terms of the civil and political rights since the Civil War, that the story that is continued and that we can and we will. Uh, so the Scottish Government should continue to take the opportunity with partnership in Rwanda and the Government should continue to raise these issues loud and clear. Much has been achieved but there is still much more to be done. Uh, and as I say, we cannot and we should never uh, forget uh, the, the genocide that took place because of that, uh, as I say, uh, and, and many people have said here today already that we turned our back on that. Uh, and that was a major, major fault and a major, major flaw. Thank you. I now call Ben McPherson to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. 
Thank you, presiding officer. First of all, I would like to thank all members uh, who have contributed to today, which has been a remarkably moving debate on the 25th anniversary commemoration of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. And in particular, I would like to thank Ian Gray for securing today's debate, but also for your incredibly moving and powerful opening speech. On the 7th of April, Rwanda began its period of 100 days of mourning to commemorate the 1994 genocide. Kwebuka means remember in Kirawanda and describes the annual commemoration of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Uh, the time to remember those who died. And today in Parliament, and indeed more widely, over the course of the last three weeks, across the world, people have come together to remember. To remember the genocide in 1994, in which, as others have said, one million Tutsi people died. On the 13th of April, I had the, the honour of joining the Rwandan High Commissioner uh, to the UK and the Rwandan diaspora uh, here in Scotland, the Rwandan Scots community, uh, at a service to commemorate the 25th anniversary. This gave me the opportunity to extend to Rwandans, uh, those in Scotland as, as well as in Rwanda, uh, and to the Rwandan government, our deepest consideration at this time of commemoration. And to reassure our Rwandan friends of our thoughts and prayers as we committed together to remember those who died. That commemoration service took place in Musselburgh, hosted by East Lothian Council, reflecting the links that have developed between Rwanda and East Lothian, as well as, as, well as other parts of Scotland in recent times. And as Ian Gray mentioned, uh, as we've heard today, Rwanda was first connected with East Lothian uh, for the Glasgow Commonwealth Games in 2014 through the Support a Second Team programme. And that programme sought to use sport to foster and develop links and partnerships between Commonwealth regions, uh, with East Lothian going on to host representatives from the Rwandan Commonwealth Games team. Uh, and that uh, is a tribute to the people of East Lothian and to Rwanda. It is a tribute to the people of East Lothian and Rwanda that those links have continued uh, and strengthened. And so it was very fitting that the commemoration service took place in East Lothian just a few weeks ago. Since 1994, over these last 25 years, Scotland's links to Rwanda have strengthened and deepened, as other speakers have mentioned. There are now many sectors, from education and health, to civil society and faith groups, to government and business, that have connections to Rwanda and are uh, creating more connections. And this is reflected in the Scottish Government's International Development Programme. In 2008, the Scottish Government funded its first development project in Rwanda. And in 2016, following a refresh of our international development strategy, Rwanda, and we're very proud of this, became one of our four partner countries under the Scottish Government's International Development Programme. Uh, our programme expanded, uh, which projects uh, now include a diversity of uh, different partnerships, uh, from support for building the capacity of Ru Rwandan co coffee cooperatives, uh, which we've, we've just expanded, uh, and also partnerships to support victims of sexual and gender-based violence and empower women to enjoy equal rights and have equal rights. Uh, also, on, on gender equality, we have been supporting with Comic Relief projects on, uh, in Rwanda under the Leveling the Field uh, Girls Leadership Through Sport programme, using football, basketball, cricket, and other sports as a, a tool for development, a connector between people and nations. 
And what all of these projects have in common is Rwandans' commitment to community, uh, to developing Rwanda, and to doing so with Rwandan solutions, underpinned by a, a clear belief in the future of the country that permeates right across Rwandan society. And it's that belief in the modern nation of Rwanda coming out of, 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 of the awful uh, genocide against the Tutsi in 94 that I think is, is also important to remember. The, the wealth of connections and relationships built up over the last 25 years between Scotland and Rwanda have been rewarding for all. Uh, and we have heard about some of those links and partnerships in other speeches today. Uh, but there's more to do. And uh, we in the Scottish Government are, as I said uh, earlier, very proud to be in, in partnership uh, with Rwanda and an international development programme. And I know uh, from uh, conversations I've had of the enthusiasm that there is not just in the international development sector, but across other sectors to continue to build up our relationship with Rwanda. But today, uh, we are, of course, uh, at this 25th anniversary uh, commemoration here to look back and remember. And uh, like I did on the 13th of April, and I'm, I'm sure I speak for this whole parliament, uh, reflecting other speakers when I say this, uh, the Scottish Government uh, wants to extend the Rwandan diaspora again here in Scotland and those back in Rwanda and to the Rwandan government, our deepest consideration at this time of commemoration. And to do so also looking forward with the people of Rwanda to a bright future and the wish that Rwanda will continue to flourish in peace and hope in the decades ahead. We stand in solidarity with our Rwandan friends as they remember the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. We remember, we unite, and we support them as they renew. Thank you, President Officer. That concludes the debate, and this meeting is suspended until 2 o'clock. <laughs>